The active ingredient in Botox is a million times more toxic than Cobra Venom and more poisonous to humans. You've just tuned into Rebel Wellness Podcast, your resource for realigning and revitalizing your health and well being. I'm your host, Kaylee, also known as Coach Kales. I'm a holistic health educator, certified nutritionist, and fitness professional of nearly a decade. I'm stoked to have you with us. You just joined a community of amazing souls who are ready to break free from the confines of the often outdated and confusing health advice all around us. Living in a world overwhelmed by quick fix diets and unrealistic beauty and body standards, us rebels stand for change. If you're like me, you're exhausted with the confusion and polarization plaguing the social media health scene. My mission is to empower you to step beyond today's diet culture, adopt a holistic health approach paired with the foundations of science for lasting well-rounded wellness. Through teaching you how to tune in and embrace your mind, body, and soul, we'll reject one-size-fits-all solutions, realigning you on a better path that honors your unique needs and values. With new episodes weekly, this podcast is your sanctuary for deep wellness exploration, featuring expert advice, real life stories, and a true commitment to your growth. Your journey to better health and simplicity in life begins now. Let's jump right in. What's up, Rebel? Welcome back. Another episode of Hot Take Summer. And this episode is going to be very interesting. And honestly, I will just just prep you with that. There is just so much that I could not put into it because I try to keep these hot takes a very hot take, especially this uh, second round this summer. And so just know that if I could have really given you the full download on this topic, I would have to be talking for hours, honestly. But welcome to the podcast. If you're new here, Hot Take Summer is my series where I spend some time discussing my hot take as a decade a health professional, nutritionist, you know, fitness professional um, in the wellness space where I talk about current popular trends, health fads, and so much more. So welcome to this episode. If you haven't listened to any of the other ones, I would definitely recommend you even check out last summer's Hot Take Summer because a lot of those topics are still extremely pertinent to the times right now. A lot of these fads, honestly, guys, are like coming back around like constantly. And so it's kind of funny to me because I just, I oftentimes am telling people who like DM me or even my friends, they're like, what do you think about this thing? And I'm like, just sending them an episode from a previous podcast. And I'm like, I have a lot of thoughts on those and I actually put it in a podcast, so go listen to it. (laughs) So with that said, go check out any of my other topics. I have a lot of great stuff already here. We are on episode 79. We are almost to episode 80. I am so excited about how consistent me and my podcast editor have been with Rebel Wellness. Um, It's definitely been my little passion project where I have really found a great platform to kind of share and chat with you about so many different topics and present you with my perspective on it. So thank you so much for being here. And if you are a diehard or a repeat offender (laughs) to this podcast, thank you for being here and supporting it. With that said, Come join our community if you haven't already, Instagram at Rebel Wellness Podcast for our podcast Instagram that we're currently trying to grow and at Kaylee Loren for my coaching page. It's the one that I've had since the beginning, since I was coached by Kales. And I very much still am coached by Kales, but you know, as the times move on and, you know, businesses grow and evolve, you know, I've evolved to my name as the brand instead of Coach by Kales because that was a lot more oriented towards my fitness side when I started off as just a personal trainer. And that was never my goal to stay just a personal trainer the rest of my life. And so now you are seeing the evolved version of Kales as the holistic functional health coach. And I love to bring all of that experience into the podcast here and I have it all over my page. I share so much more. You'll really enjoy following um, those pages from my 
Instagram presence. And coachchaos.com is the best place to look into more ways to work with me and freebies that I have, some great free downloads that are going to constantly keep rolling out. I've got some great ones in the work right now. So if you want to be the first to find out when those come out, come join our newsletter. It's a one time a month wellness newsletter that I put out for you guys full of a whole bunch of great stuff that uh, includes journal prompts, clean beauty hacks, mantras, links to different posts that I make about burning wellness questions and topics. And I will always let you guys know when I launch new resources, courses, and other ways that you can learn from me and just grow on your wellness journey in general, because that is what we're all here for, right? We are rebels in our wellness journey. (laughs) So anyways, happy you're here. Hope you come join the community. And let's talk about what we're talking about today. So it was kind of funny because when I was researching in, I always take notes when I plan out these episodes and I wrote Botox talk and I was like, Botox. (laughs) For those of you who enjoy a fun little pun, today we are doing some Botox. Um, Not actual Botox. We're just going to talk about it, obviously. And I do want to say for this conversation, if you are somebody who partakes in Botox, has in the past, plans to in the future, there is no judgment coming from me. Okay, you do what you want to do with your face and your skin. I am simply here to provide you with my best take on the knowledge you should know when it comes to how do these cosmetic procedures impact your health potentially, and what you should be aware of. Because if you just go into something blindly for years on end, and then suddenly you have this major health event, you probably could have been well more well educated, and hopefully know that like there is a little responsibility when it comes to certain medical procedures, especially injections that we take nowadays, Well, especially when it's a neurotoxin, you know, like Botox is quite literally a toxin. Like that is how it works. We're going to talk a lot more about that soon, but I want you to be, have, I want you to have foresight rather. So if you're here listening, what you are, (laughs) I am so glad that you will be able to arm yourself with some knowledge that should help you make that decision a little bit better. Because I've had so many friends and clients and just, I've seen it all over the social medias, people doing or feeling obligated or pressured to do Botox. I've actually had conversations where I've heard friends utilize terminology where they have to start doing their preventative Botox soon as if it's something that like is required. And that is honestly really disappointing, you know, as a female and as somebody who is more of a, you know, holistic feminist. I don't even know if there's a term for it, but I truly feel like We have to be neutral about certain trends. And if you choose to partake in one of them, go for it. Like I was saying before, if you choose not to, there is no shame and there's nothing wrong with you. And there's, you know, no disappointing results that you're going to get just because you don't keep up with whatever the Kardashians are doing, you know, and reality is you get to choose how you want to age yourself. And a lot of women, especially nowadays, are choosing to age naturally and just partake in health habits that maybe aren't so sexy sounding and are maybe not as easy as just sticking something in your skin and shooting yourself up and taking pills and all this different stuff. And I think that there is a lot of honor in that because really embracing your natural aging process is extremely sexy to me. I think it is probably one of the highest ways we can honor ourselves as natural female beings is to, or just beings in general, is just to really prioritize what we were born with and how to take the best care of it and just showing up for ourselves through lifestyle habits that naturally help us quote unquote age more gracefully. And I think that that is something that I've been seeing shift in the wellness space, um, especially as we are kind of now the pendulum is swinging back to our roots. We're trying to actually take care of ourselves naturally to the most grassroots extent where people are actually just being like, no, like I actually want to put less 
creams and junk on my body. I want to use less chemicals. I want to eat less chemicals. I want to eat less processed things and weird stuff that's just not meant for my body. I want to have sun in my eyes. I want to play outside. I don't want to use as much sunblock, but I still want to be like protected with the sun. You know, like what natural ways can I do that? And there's a ton of natural ways you can do that, you know, future podcast episode on that soon. But there's so many things I've been seeing that I'm absolutely loving because humans are starting to realize that like we had been doing it a certain way for so many decades and centuries before and we're doing fine. And now we've really kind of bastardized our health and we've tried to make it very confusing, almost in a way where it was like cleverly designed by capitalism (laughs) to sell you things, sell you more and more and more. And the fat loss industry is literally a billion dollar industry. I mean, hello, it's getting launched out the wazoo with semaglutides, terzipatides, and all these different things. You guys should or probably will know about what I'm talking about. I'm talking Ozempic, Manjaro, all of those. How much those shots cost and are getting the pharmacies that created them are getting paid for them are insane amounts of money. It's just furthering the diet culture and all of that um, and how much money it makes people. So I would like to kind of, I just wanted to open the conversation today with acknowledging the fact that we are definitely in a very unique time right now. And if you are somebody like me who is just overwhelmed with the chase and the rat race to stay up to date with making our face look basically like a Kardashian or uh, anybody, you know, um, I've mostly seen people really just try to copy that look like really plump lips high cheekbones, big eyes with lots of eyelashes and dark eyebrows, you know, like it's probably going to shift in several years again. But that look is typically achieved by most other people. I mean, even by them through fillers and Botox and makeup and all that kind of stuff. And so if you are somebody who doesn't want to partake in that, but feels the pressure of it and feels like, okay, maybe I should do Botox, like what is that or is there any harm with that? Like, you know, this or that. That is what I'm talking about today. That is why we're talking about Botox. And it is one of those things where I hope that everything we talk about today, you don't necessarily feel judgy or judged. I want you to feel like you just know that like, okay, there are always going to be risks that come with certain chemicals that we inject into our body. And what do you want to do moving forward? You know what I mean? How do you want to take care of yourself for your future self? And that is the big game. That is the long term game, just doing what you can with the knowledge you have now to help yourself better in the future. So with all of that said, (laughs) let's talk about Botox. And I would say too. Again, kind of keeping up with some of the celebrity gossip, and I will just interject that I get majority of my celebrity gossip from Snapchat stories, like um, the little stories that they have on their like news feature. Um, I will occasionally browse those because they're just quick and easy and they kind of keep me slightly up to date on some of the stuff. (laughs) Or I usually will get also gossip from my friends who partake in, you know, all the different TV shows and shenanigans like that. But recently, a lot of light has been kind of cast on the way that Kylie Jenner's face looks um, and how it looks really aged recently now that she's been kind of doing filler and Botox for years now. And filler and Botox, guys, it is always temporary. You have to keep getting injected and refill every three to six months. It kind of depends on what, how much, how much you needed, what your lymph system does, what your body does, blah, blah, blah. A lot of different things come into how long it'll last for you. But she's still in her 20s and she's looking something like her late 30s now. When the light is kind of shown at a certain angle, you can look up the, the photos. Her eyes are sunken in underneath. Her cheeks look really sunken. Um, her forehead look looks aged. You know, it doesn't look like the airbrushed photos of her maybe several years ago. And this has brought up a lot of conversation of a big red flag where medical professionals are talking about the truths of utilizing these substances long term and the risks that can come with it and often do come with it because of the mechanism at which these operate. So 
We are going to dive into the actual safety of the long-term use of Botox, why it does what it does, what you should be aware of, and um, maybe, uh, and also for sure, my best professional tips on how to take the best care of your skin naturally so that you have good youthfulness as you age without needing to use injections, okay? So stay tuned all the way to the end for that. That's what we're going to get into. But let's go ahead and jump into this conversation about Botox. All right, a kind of fun fact, if you will call it, to kick off this take on Botox. Did you know that the active ingredient in Botox is a million times more toxic than Cobra Venom? and more poisonous to humans than cyanide. That's straight up the truth. I even researched it multiple times. I was like, is that for real or is that just kind of like a clout thing? No, that is for real. But the way that the major company that provides Botox has isolated and um, sort of stabilized the active ingredient in Botox, it is supposedly removed its risk of being poisonous. However, there are some gray areas. So we'll talk about that in a second. But what exactly is Botox aside from just being a face freezer? So botulinum neurotoxins are extremely lethal poisons that are produced by the bacteria Colostridium botulinum. And they enter the neurons and bind to the vesicles that carry the neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. So ACH is what we would abbreviate that as. And that prevents the release of acetylcholine to the brain. ACH causes the muscles to contract as well in our body. And so botulinum toxins cause muscular paralysis through that mechanism. So essentially, those toxins cause paralysis so that the muscles cannot respond to the ACH. And there are several distinct forms of botulinum toxin, and there's types A, B, C, D, E, F, G, it ends at G. <laughs> and Botox treatments utilize the purified and heavily diluted botulinum neurotoxin type A. Okay, so that's kind of important to know is that it's type A, which is how you kind of can differentiate between whether or not it is going to become a immediate toxin to your body or if it can potentially just stay to where it's injected. But very little is known about the long-term health effects of taking Botox because most clinical trials only follow up on patients for six months or so. And that was something that honestly I was suspect of because a lot, especially for female products, I mean, everybody, males and females, use Botox. However, Things that are dominantly used by females rarely get longevity studies, especially when it's something that's cosmetic that generates a lot of profit. That's just unfortunately the way it is. Nobody's going to fund research to find out things that could make a multi-million dollar industry obsolete because that would be a huge flop. Like, I mean, that would be not productive for the capitalistic side of companies, right? So because that's just not the direction that businesses go when they want to continue profiting off of cosmetic procedures. So when you look into the long-term effects of Botox, unfortunately, you're going to be barred by the fact that they actually don't have anything that is longer than about half a year. Some have started to research like longer than. However, it's really hard to control for a variety of variables that can happen between the actual injections, who injected it, where they injected it, was it the actual proper FDA approved Botox or, you know, was it actually a healthcare professional or was it just a nurse practitioner that is just, uh, or an esthetician rather, because nurse practitioners are medical professionals. But there are a lot of people who inject that are not actually medically registered to be safely injecting. And that is unfortunately wildly common. I think it when I looked it up, it was roughly 68% of people who administer in Botox injections are not actually medical professionals. So this is where we start to see there isn't enough consistent and controlled research available because of all these different 
factors that come into how people get injected with Botox. So it is kind of complicated for those reasons. However, some of the studies that have been performed, they've found that long-lasting cosmetic use of the botulinum toxin, aka Botox, it can trigger permanent facial changes when it comes to facial expressions with people no longer being able to flex their facial muscles. So the way that Botox works is through literally neutralizing paralysis, aka paralysis, the muscle's ability to contract. So aka you can't use it. I mean, all most of us have seen people with Botox, especially like Botox botch jobs where they, they're smiling, but the rest of their face doesn't move or, you know, a variety of things like that. And so more than just the fact that I had heard back in the day that mothers who Botox their face do a disservice to their children when they're growing up because they cannot discern facial expression facial expressions paired with emotions as well because they were never able to see those facial expressions on their mother's face or their father's or whoever. Whoever uses Botox that is a parent figure, a guardian, let's say. And so that was really interesting to me. But it actually turns out that people who regularly in a 2022 review study, people who regularly received Botox injections, they showed changes in their muscle composition, function, and appearance up to four years after their last injection. And what is getting more buzz from that study is that they're finding that some of the toxins escaped into other neurons via an unknown mechanism. They don't know how the toxins got elsewhere into other neurons, which isn't great because that means they are going around into our brain. And that is scary. (laughs) And that was always a factor that I always was concerned about. I was like, how are we literally shooting neurotoxins right into our face, which is right by our brain? You know, the blood brain barrier isn't super robust when it comes to agonists for neurons. So things that communicate through neuron to neuron. And when quite literally the toxin communicates to neurons by blocking communication, which sounds kind of funny. Um, I'm trying to put it into layman's terms for you guys so that it's not too sciencey, but essentially when its mechanism impedes the function of neuron communication, that means that it is impacting your neurons in your brain. You know, and so that's something that is really risky as a long term effect of using Botox. And when most of that studies that I've read have talked about long term use, we're talking five plus years of consistent use. Ultimately, 10 plus years is what they consider extended long term use, which is not that hard to do for women who start using Botox maybe in their late 20s and continue into their early 40s. And so Something that I found particularly intriguing, though, were the recent studies that were done on the with those studies that were done on the brain impacts of the long term use. Another study that came up was in 2023 and a neurologist named Mitchell Brin at the University of California, Irvine. He and his colleagues had scanned the brains of 10 women before and after they received Botox injections. And during imaging of their brains, the subjects were shown photos of angry and happy faces interspersed with neutral photos. And on the post-Botox scan, the women showed altered activity in two regions of the brain that are known to play a role in processing emotion, which are your amygdala and fusiform gyrus. According to that study, though, the explanation could be down to how our brains recognize other people's emotions. So, for example, when we see expressions of happiness or sadness in others, we unconsciously copy them using our own facial muscles. So this helps us kind of understand and interpret how others are feeling. And because Botox paralyzes the facial muscles, those people who were injected could no longer mimic other people's faces, which potentially was making them less empathetic because of how their brains were responding to the facial expressions that they were shown later. And this is particularly interesting because with the previous study I was just talking about where the children are stunted with understanding facial expressions, so is the same as the person receiving the Botox. They may lose 
the ability to be more empathetic in relation to other people's facial expressions by not actually being able to mimic those facial expressions on themselves. Really interesting. I was like, wow, that is kind of not expected because I can totally see the whole situation with the children. And I mean, because even for me, when I've seen some people who have done quite a bit of Botox and they're reacting to something, I'm like, do you have an emotional response to that? Because if you're making a face, but it's not showing, I'm not sure. You know what I mean? But it turns out they're even stunted by their own ability to be empathetic because they cannot even make the facial expressions themselves. Very interesting, right? But a different angle, though, is that along with its kind of common use in facial freezing, we'll call it, it's become increasingly popular to use Botox therapeutically in muscles where you might be experiencing chronic tension in order to help relieve pain from those hyperactive muscles, muscles such as like the traps in your neck that can cause migraines and a variety of other areas that can cause a lot of chronic pain. So when I was diving into the research on this, most recently, one of the bigger reviews that were done in the Journal of Pharmacology in 2015, they found that serious adverse reactions of using Botox in larger muscle groups occurred more frequently in therapeutic use to treat patients instead of cosmetically. So there was something to be said about higher risk of getting adverse reactions to Botox and Botox, the toxin traveling throughout the body was found to come higher with use in shooting, injecting into muscles on the body versus the small muscles to freeze it on your face, largely due to the fact as well that they are usually injecting larger volumes of Botox into these muscles. And especially, you know, the most common one I saw recently that I've had clients message me and send me videos on like health talk and stuff of shooting it into their traps. Um, to help with migraines, but also to make sure that those muscles don't grow when working out because some females decided that having larger traps looked masculine, I guess. But in reality, let me let me step back for a sec and tell you from the years of fitness I've had professionally <laughs> that if you are growing your traps too much, you most likely are not activating and utilizing your deltoid muscles, aka your shoulder muscles. There's three major muscles on your shoulders. If you are getting too much traps, you're not and you're you're usually doing shoulder workouts and you're growing your traps because those muscles are not properly activated. So you have to look into your form and your proper activation to avoid utilizing your traps too much. Most often than not, a lot of muscles will overcompensate for deactivated muscles. And nowadays, 99% of people that I come across have cell phone posture or desk posture, um, a kind of situation we call upper cross syndrome, where you're curved forward, you've been sitting at a desk, your posterior muscles, meaning your back muscles, are usually lengthened. Sometimes they are in a position that we call locked long, where they have atrophied or they are just stuck in a contracted long position. And your front, your anterior muscles, so like your chest muscles and some of your shoulder, your deltoid muscles, um, your biceps are all contracted forward. And so they're shortened in the front. And then this causes a lot of issues long term, even if you've just been sitting like that for about a year. It can cause a lot of issues where now your back muscles, when you're asking them to work for you, especially if you're doing like shoulder exercises or even just anything requiring raising overhead, your trap muscles are going to kick in more than the other muscles that should be supporting. And all that to say, there's a lot you can do physically to help get those trap muscles to relax that does not require Botox. And there's a lot you can do to not grow those trap muscles that doesn't require Botox. So utilizing Botox in a way to be therapeutic when it comes to chronic hyperactive muscles is really, it should be avoided altogether, in my opinion, especially since this research in that 2015 study found that most serious adverse reactions to Botox came when using it therapeutically for things like that instead of just cosmetically in your face. So 
I had to kind of chat about that for a second because it is really important to know that a lot of people will just rush off to cortisol injections, Botox injections, anything to just like quote unquote deactivate the muscle or mute the pain when in reality they should be putting in some time and effort into fixing the dysfunction with a good quality physical therapist or just biomechanic specialist in general in your area that will really help you fix that dysfunction because those things are absolutely fixable. That is also something where I find high quality chiropractors to be massively helpful. And a lot of people can get their chiropractic covered by insurance as well. And a lot of chiropractic clinics will have physical therapists or other body workers on staff that can give you a more all-encompassed care plan to help you move better and utilize the muscles that are on your body properly. Because everything from SI joint issues to chronic migraine tensions from overactive traps are absolutely fixable without medication, okay? And just kind of trying to barrel through life and ignore pain that's coming in that hardcore is going to cause you a lot more issues than necessary. And it's it's amazing how I've been able to see actual real humans improve chronic pain through strength training and like a well-balanced program when it comes to their fitness, as well as physical therapy and things like that, versus going to doctors, getting surgeries, getting injections and all that stuff. Um, That's like pain management. It's not fixing the pain problem. I know it's a little tangent there, but because a lot of people tend to go to Botox, especially lately for therapeutic treatment um, and the risk of having that toxin impair your body long term is too great in my opinion, especially from what I've seen on the research, that you should really look for another route before you even consider Botox in any other muscle than your face. (laughs) All right. So, okay. So let's kind of close out the sciencey talk about risks for Botox with trying to understand a little bit from like a cellular level, what Botox kind of does to the body um, more than what I've already kind of told you. So obviously it induces muscle atrophy which means that you end up with mitochondrial dysfunction in at the cellular level, which means that those cells will not operate at their best faster. So because Botox induces much muscle atrophy, you're going to see the aging process of the cells in your face increase, <laughs> which is sort of ironic, right? Because you're trying to use Botox to look younger and stay younger looking, when in reality, you're actually impairing the mitochondria in the cells in your face to the extent where it actually is going to speed up the aging process. So that's not great from even the most tiniest extent physiologically in your body. But also, Botox encourages your skin to thin sooner as well, in part by the same mechanism I just discussed, because it lessens the natural stimulation and production of collagen, especially because you're no longer using those muscles and contracting. And whenever you use your facial muscles, you contract and relax those muscles, right? That in your body even is what stimulates collagen production and is how people who strength train and especially strength train Uh, with heavier weights, improve the production of collagen in the body increases through strength training. And so that is one of the ways where you're doing a disservice to your facial muscles and the skin on your face through Botox usage, because when your muscles are no longer being used and activated, you're also actively making those parts of your face reduce that plumpness and fullness that comes from stimulating collagen. So that is also a downside to utilizing too much Botox for too long. And in turn, you become sort of a slave to using Botox because you are constantly needing to do more of it to try to achieve the look you're going for. And this is where a lot of people end up having to do the little dance of Botox, then filler, Botox, and filler. (laughs) 
I'm not discussing filler in this conversation, but if you'd like me to have another hot take summer on filler, I absolutely can do that. But uh, so shoot me a message on Instagram or something. um, Or if you're one of my clients, just let me know when I see you, if you would like me to do that, because I'm a little bit concerned about it because of everything I learned when I did this research on Botox. But I think it's also very important that we are armed with knowledge on filler because filler is violently common nowadays as well. But again, to finish out this conversation before I get into my best tips to help you avoid needing to use Botox or what you want to do if you just want to naturally age as you would naturally age the best, let's talk about the risks that do come with using Botox outside of just what I just talked about from the way that it impacts the actual physical look. So if you are somebody who has an autoimmune disease like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, you are at very high risk for having complications when using Botox. There's a whole bunch of different reasons why that happens, but unfortunately, the way that the Botox toxin looks when it's injected into your skin is very similar to the way that your immune system is identifying the tissues in your body that it wants to attack and get out. Essentially, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, for example, is your immune system is on overload to identify the protein and the tissue that is in your system that is causing issues. And it tends to read the thyroid tissue as that same material in your body. And therefore, it it tries to attack everything that looks the same. And so with that said, Botox looks very similar to that, to that tissue in your body, and therefore your body starts to attack the Botox as well. So that is complicated and very kind of risky. So if you're somebody who has any type of autoimmune disease, you should really avoid using Botox. There was light research talking about even people who have hypothyroidism, so underactive thyroid, should be concerned about using Botox, especially long term as well, because you run the risk of pushing your immune system into a Hashimoto's thyroiditis zone. So you can inadvertently cause Hashimoto's potentially by using Botox long term because of the way that everything kind of attacks itself and your thyroid is already underactive. So therefore, you can cause it to become more underactive through use of Botox. Again, These are really complex situations, so I totally apologize if they're coming through a little bit clunky because it's it's a lot to talk about and discuss while making it sort of easy to comprehend, right? So I hope that this is making a lot of a little bit more sense to you, but I do want to just make sure that I present some of these things because it is really important. So more of the very broad complications that they have on record that does happen with Botox usage less commonly, but still enough that it is in the kind of adverse reactions report is issues with your respiratory system, speech disturbance, a variety of eye diseases, cervical kyphosis, which is when your upper back of your spine kind of curves outward and pokes out. So you kind of look similar to like that hunchback kind of vibe. And even a rare syndrome called Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a rare neurological syndrome where your immune system mistakenly attacks part of your peripheral nervous system, and which is the network of the nerves that carry signals from your brain to your spinal cord and then to the rest of your body. So that is really non-ideal <laughs> to, to deal with that syndrome because they don't actually have a cure for that yet either. And similarly to like thyroid issues, you only get one thyroid. You cannot get a thyroid from somebody else like a donor. So if you don't take care of your thyroid now, you're just looking at a long-term risk of issues with your thyroid, which your thyroid does like so many things for your body, including your metabolism. So it is really important to prioritize your thyroid health as much as you can, especially for us females. And the other risk is that if you don't see a licensed esthetician who administers your Botox, you should be aware that there are a lot of those out on the market in med spas and a variety of places. So a big risk is that you may end up with an unlicensed practitioner. So you always want to make sure that you are getting Botox done from a licensed 
health professional and make sure that it's not you're not going for the super cheap Botox um, because there's a high chance that it's counterfeit might be compounded and might not be the right version that is um, FDA approved for usage and safer and stabilized. Most cases of the life threatening botulism occur when people see unlicensed practitioners that are not healthcare professionals and are using counterfeit Botox, even if they don't tell you it outright. You'll usually get situations like this at med spas and places like that outside of the country, like in Mexico, Turkey, a variety of places. A large majority of the recorded deaths due to people using Botox to encourage weight loss and such um, were in like Turkey for example. So uh, I would highly recommend you don't try and get these procedures outside of the U.S. because you are no longer in a controlled state with who administers it. But again, I would make sure that if you are getting Botox done, it is a licensed medical professional and they are using the appropriate Botox brand so that you're not risking uh, cheaper counterfeit Botox, okay? Okay, enough of all that. There's a lot to be said. I didn't even get to cover all the things that are surrounding Botox, but again, it's one of those things that it's so commonly used. People love it so much that nobody likes to hear how much (laughs) risk comes with utilizing this toxin. Um, And again, not really talking about it in a form where I want any sort of shame or any of that to be instilled upon you. (laughs) I just want you to know that there are definitely risks. You can't just stick your head in the sand when it comes to using this toxin to temporarily change your face. All right. Um, So my professional tips If you are somebody who, like me, wants to avoid using Botox but wants to promote as much youthfulness as possible as I age, here are the things that you got to do. Some of them, you're going to be like, okay, I should have known better. This is obvious. (laughs) And then other ones hopefully are helpful for you. But first one is stay well hydrated. You need ample electrolytes as much as possible consistently through your week. So you need that sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, chloride. You need good quality electrolytes. I have on my website a section for my all my Amazon recommendations, including my top recommended electrolytes that you can use um, to achieve healthier skin. And it is very important that you stay as hydrated as possible because your cells do not operate their best when you are chronically dehydrated and or just partially dehydrated. And a large majority of us nowadays are chronically dehydrated. If you're not drinking If you're drinking less than 50 ounces of water a day, you are dehydrated. For most adult females, we need 75 ounces or more. And most male adults need 90 ounces or more. So make sure that you are being very mindful and conscientious about how much water you consume every day. I usually advise my clients use a 32 ounce or a 40 ounce water bottle and drink two to three of those a day at least. And I always recommend you use a straw. You're going to get more water in at once and use what I like to call the chug method, where every time that you drink water, you take three or four or five big chugs because you will get more down in that moment where you're taking time to take a sip or a drink. Don't take a sip, take a drink. (laughs) Get enough water if you're going to be putting water in your mouth. But the next thing that I would advise is that you prioritize your best rest at least 90% of the time. So this doesn't account for that random time where you had a bender of a weekend with some girlfriends or like for me, my anything to do with my wedding (laughs) was poor sleep just by the nature of all of it. Um, But that shouldn't be a large majority of my year, right? I'm not going on benders every weekend and all that kind of stuff. So I'd really encourage you to become more mindful and aware of your sleep quality 90% of the time. So majority, like six days out of your week, you know, how well are you sleeping? Are you getting into deep sleep? You know, are you using certain trackers like an aura ring or your Apple watch or a whoop band to try to get a better understanding of your actual quality of your sleep? I would definitely recommend if you've never done that before and you want to improve your sleep, get one of those trackers and use it for at least six months. And then you can kind of observe and learn which ways your sleep is getting disturbed and it can help be a little snapshot into what 
your lifetime of sleep probably looked like, right? So that is an important thing to focus on because cellular autophagy, which means when your body's immune system is identifying the bad little cells that are technically, they could become cancer, you know, cells that are broken and messed up, it catches them and dispels them in your detox system and helps you stay healthy and devoid of diseases and such um, when you sleep, especially when you sleep deeply. So you're robbing your body of that if you don't sleep well consistently and your aging will progress a lot faster because of that. So prioritize your sleep. It's not one of those things where it's cute anymore to say, I'll sleep when I'm dead, you know, (laughs) Uh, because then you will, you will literally speed that process of dying up. (laughs) Um, Okay. And then you really want to reduce or avoid altogether alcohol. I know, super lame. Don't roll your eyes at me right now. But alcohol is a poison to the body. And by design, it is a major cause of a slew of issues. And it has zero support for your healthy production of collagen, which again is the major way that our skin stays bouncy and healthy. And it alcohol, because it's a poison, it actively supports inflammation, puffiness, redness, you know, flaky looking skin, discoloration, bags under your eyes, dark, dark skin under your eyes, because it stresses your adrenals, you know, there's a whole lot of things even like the change of facial features because of long-term consumption of alcohol. And I'm not even talking like you need a lot of alcohol every day. Literally one drink a day or one drink every other day is enough to become chronic consumption of alcohol, aka poison, and it's going to take a toll on your body. And so especially when it comes to managing your, if if you're concerned of your appearance, especially on your face, you should really consider cutting back or entirely cutting out alcohol as much as you can because it's just not promotive of um, healthy skin and and beautiful looking face when it comes to that. Uh, I don't know about you, but like celebrities that avoid alcohol together and are known for it, like Blake Lively, J-Lo, Gwen Stefani, you know, they all don't drink alcohol. If anything, they might have occasional, I think actually even Kim Kardashian doesn't drink alcohol. Um, It's like very rare very rare occasions. So again, that 90, 95% of the time avoiding alcohol is going to be very supportive of aging more gracefully. So I know for me, the last several years, I've had more than usual for a variety of reasons, including grief, which is not my recommendation. You know, I'm aware of it now. And that is the thing that is going to help me long term (laughs) avoid uh, back into it. But I definitely noticed my face changed. Um, if you were radically honest with yourself and you have gone through, you know, like a drinking bender for several years or something like that, has your face changed? Has your skin become like complicated to keep balanced? Does it just look weird? You know, like my eyes, you know, would not look like the right shape. I would look, I just look unhealthy. You know what I mean? Um, and so for me, those were all just like outward signs that like, it's not a habit that is productive of my health and especially not a good habit productive of my aging. So definitely recommend you cut out alcohol (laughs) as much as you can. And then supplements that are really important that are supportive of collagen production. Some people could say you could just take collagen as a supplement, sure. But actually where you might find more benefits is taking supplements that are all the precursors to your natural production of collagen because your body will make collagen itself. Um, Or you want to take L-lysine, amino acids, proline, and vitamin C, A, D, E, zinc, and your omega-3 fatty acids. Those are There's a lot of different things that you could take as far as vitamins and minerals go that support healthy, happy skin and aging. However, those are like the major ones that are kind of um, collagen production precursors when it comes to trying to support that area naturally. But again, there's a whole bunch of great stuff that you can be doing when it comes to taking better care of your skin. Um, A lot of people do tout, you know, sunblock and such. I would be very conscientious of what kind of sunblock you're using and how much. Um, It's a very 
complicated area from my perspective now at this point of how much sunblock you want to use and how frequently. I will talk more about that actually soon on a near future Hot Take Summer episode on sunblock because I do think there are some really interesting things that you guys will learn about it where it actually could be harming our health more than helping. But when it does come to preventing aging on our skin, we do know sun damage is a major offender. So finding a healthy, good quality higher rating sunblock for your face, at least for your face and your neck and your chest is that will be a really good place for you to prioritize, especially if you're exposing yourself to the sun for the later parts of the day after you get your morning sunlight or whatever, you know? (laughs) So, all right, Rebel, that's it for today's episode. I hope that you kind of got a better understanding of some of the risks for Botox. Again, this is only some of the risks I would be talking for days for all the other ones. But again, it's a very gray area. So you may find things that will say, oh, you know, we have never found any actual long-term significant health problems because blah, blah, blah. But in reality, it's because they have never done a long-term research study on women who frequently use Botox for years on end. They're, they've not ever done a longevity study on it. Uh, so that's concerning in its own. <laughs> so make whatever uh, conclusions you want for yourself. But I do hope that this helps you better decide if you want to even start Botox or if you want to continue Botox or if you know anybody who does, who you know probably doesn't know many of the risks that they are putting themselves at, share this episode with them. But as always, celebrate your strength and nourishment. Walk with confidence. I'll catch you next week on another Hot Tech Summer episode of Rebel Wellness. What did you think about that episode? If you enjoyed it, I hope that you would come join my community on Instagram at Rebel Wellness Podcast or my coaching page at Kaylee Loren or both. I would love to see your name pop up on my new follows list. I might say hello if I catch you. And I would also like to invite you to come check out my website, coachkales.com. If you're interested in seeing any more of the educational learning resources I have created for you, I have a whole ton of amazing free downloads that you can like dip your toe in the water of what working with me looks like. And if you are really vibing with what I have to say and how I teach it, come explore my courses that are available for purchase. They are all do it yourself. In the near future, I plan to have some awesome group coaching that will be all live. So stay tuned for that. And the best way to know when I'm going to launch those is through my monthly wellness newsletter, which is my hand curated, not AR generated, monthly all things health and wellness newsletter that I created to be your new favorite resource for staying up to date with the latest in the health world, self-care resources that I've created, and a bunch of the clean beauty picks that I personally use myself and a whole lot more, as well as early access and discounts to anything that I create in the future for specifically my newsletter sign up. So if you'd like to sign up, head to coachkales.com and add yourself to my mailing list. Last but not least, I would absolutely love it if you would help our podcast grow by simply sharing a rating or review wherever you stream and are listening to me right now and share it on your social medias or text it to some friends or family members if this episode resonated and was something that you think could help somebody else because I really would love to help anybody in your circle if I've been helping you. So I absolutely am so grateful that you're here. And if you listened all the way through, you are a real one. So all right, Rebel, until next episode.